Hi, this is Mark from LongIslandWatch.com, and welcome to episode number three of Watch and Learn. Today we're going to be discussing jewels, watch jewels, what are they? And no, there's nothing wrong with your screen. Uh, it is somewhere in the middle of the screen, right there. There is a watch jewel, and most of this video will be done under magnification, but I will bring it up close to the camera. This is the little jewel that people are talking about, or one of the ones that people are talking about when they say how many jewels a watch has. It's this little tiny ruby that is you know, maybe a millimeter across and it's got a small hole uh, drilled in it. So this is the thing that makes mechanical watches work. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about them. I uh, mostly perpetrated I'd say by the affordable watch affordable automatic watch industry in the late 90s or early 2000s. We'll talk about them, we'll get into detail, we'll do, uh, I have a little microscope here and we'll put everything under the microscope and I can show you what jewels are, what rubies are, what they mean, where they came from, and you'll see that they are an extremely important part of your mechanical watch. So to start, this, this jewel came from the auto winding plate of a junk watch that I have in the office, something that was uh, water, water damaged. So I removed some of the corrosion and I'm going to put the jewel down, don't lose sight of it. And then here is the top plate it came from. I've removed all the gears. But this is, what this is, is this is the auto winder plate. I'm going to hold it in my tweezers so you can try to get a better look at it. My hands are shaky. I am not a good watchmaker. I am not a watchmaker, excuse me. And you guys know that by now, but You'll get this, this video will certainly give you an appreciation for working with things on a small scale. This is the thing that you see when you turn over your automatic watch. Uh, the oscillating weight attaches, whoops, attaches to the center here with a screw, and then you can see this racetrack around it. The weight, you know, flies around, you know, spins around the center. It spins gears and it winds the mainspring. Whoops. And on this bridge, or on this plate, there's, you can see, maybe you can see them. There's a couple of jewels. There's a jewel here. There's a jewel here. Um, there were a couple of more. I punched them out. I actually lost three of them while I was preparing to film the video. It's actually pretty funny. <laughs> um, but inside these these jewels are little holes. You can probably, maybe you can see it. If not, don't worry. We'll, we'll magnify everything soon. And that is where all the magic happens. It's what reduces friction. It's what makes a watch, you know, which, it's what makes mechanical wristwatches work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it up a bit and I'm going to turn on the microscope. I'm going to film the microscope. So it might not be the best image quality, but I think you'll get a feel for everything. And we should have a, a good watch and learn, I hope. Okay, we're back. So now we're looking at magnification. We're under, I don't know, probably about 50 or yeah, less than that, maybe 10 or 15 times magnification. And you can, this is the same top plate I was showing you before, and you can probably make out the jewels. One here, one here, and then I'll bring over the one I had before. This is the one I was showing you in the beginning of the video. You can see it's super tiny. So what are jewels? Well, jewels are jewels. They are, originally they were rubies and sapphires. Uh, rarely ever diamonds because uh, they're too too expensive to manufacture uh, but rubies and sapphires and originally back you know back long ago before modern fabrication techniques they actually you know mined rubies for this purpose cut them shape them drill them you know just to fit them in this steel plate so now why do we use these or why do watchmakers use these well the, your watch is full of gears. It's got one big spring, a couple of springs, gears, and you know here's a little gear. And this gear wants to rotate without friction for your watch to be reliable, for it to be accurate. And they could just take the little pivot, the little piece that sticks out from the gear that it rotates on, and they could stick it right into this brass plate or this nickel. This is probably nickel plated brass. This top plate, and let it rotate. But the watch may or may not run. There'll probably be too much friction. And if it does run, it'll be extremely inaccurate. Uh, so what they've done, or the idea was, is we'll take this extremely smooth, hard material that we call, you know, a, a jewel. 
will fit it into the hole, a hole like this one, that we drill into the plate. And that way, the gear can rotate with its pivot, the thing that sticks out of the side, in that hole. And that creates, you know, a very low friction interface. And we get about one third of the friction that we would if it was just brass on brass or, or, or brass on steel, whatever the case may be. Uh, and that's without lubrication. Don't forget these things are also lubricated. So it's very low friction, but maybe even more importantly, it's very predictable friction and very uh, stable friction so that the movement can run reliably. So there's many different kinds of jewels. I'm going to try to push all this over. This is not easy. I'm going to bring over where this came from. So this came from a defunct movement. Uh, let me try to brighten it up a little bit. This came from a defunct movement. I took the bridge off. Uh, and you can see, you know, all the parts here. Now, originally when watches were developed, as I was saying before, they used real, you know, real jewels. And it's gen the general consensus is, is for a hand-winding watch with three hands, that is minutes, hours, and seconds, you require about 17 jewels to run it. Uh, you need two pallet stones, cap jewels, and then when you add up all the other uh, jewels that are used for uh, rotating gears, you get to 17. So 17 was a magic number, and then, you know, back in, you know, the 80s and 90s, the Quartz Revolution took over and almost eradicated the entire automatic watch movement, uh, especially the, there was no uh, affordable automatics. But then when you know, technology caught up and they were able to manufacture these jewels at a very low cost, I'm trying to pick one up. You know, they're able to manufacture these at a low cost synthetically. So now we're away from real sapphires and rubies and now we're just using synthetic rubies. So much, you know, the way that they were producing, they produce sapphire crystals, they can now produce rubies for watches. And they produce them with modern day techniques, chemical etching and various, you know, uh, cutting procedures that we really don't, you know, that we're not used to. Uh, they certainly didn't have them 100 years ago or 50 years ago. And they made jewels very affordable. What happened then was, you know, I'd say in the late, in the, excuse me, in the, in the mid 90s that affordable wristwatch manufacturers started to take jewels. And I'm not saying that this one is one of them. But they would add jewels to the plate in erroneous areas. I mean, the, all the jewels in this watch are necessary. Uh, but they were adding jewels where they weren't needed. And for no reason at all. Other than to jack up the jewel count and make people think that uh, more jewels is better. It's not. You need a certain number of jewels to make a watch function. And depending on the complications you have in the watch, whether it be, you know, a chronograph, a day, date, dual time zone maybe extra power reserve moon phase. Everything you do adds complexity to the movement. We call them complications, and it requires more joules. So is a 25-joule watch better or movement better than a 21-joule? No, the answer is no, it's not. Uh, you know, the finest movements have 17 joules, some of the finest movements. You know, this is maybe simpler is better. Uh, you'd want to, you know, in a watch especially, you want to remove friction as much as possible, and the best way to do that is to have the least amount of, you know, moving parts, you know, if you will, and that way friction is really kept down. So, you know, starting, I would say, I don't know, in the last five or ten years, we saw more manufacturers making movements, and I would say they came, you know, down to earth, 21 joules, 25 joules. You know, the ETA 2824, which people consider the gold standard, uh, with a date as a 25 joule movement, uh, without the date, believe it or not, it was only a 21 joule movement. That was the ETA 2824-1, uh, which is not a movement that you see anymore. Uh, Seiko movements are 24 joules. Miotas are 21 joules. It's all over the place. Every manufacturer has their own specific you know, number of joules that they use in their watches. Anyway, um, I'm talking a lot. So let me, as you see, uh, while I was talking, you saw me plucking the balance. And again, this watch is garbage. It is total garbage. Uh, it was rusted. And, you know, for fun, I took the bridge off. You know, it was over here. I took it off. Um, and, you know, just to show you guys the inside of the watch. But what I'd like to do is show you, you know, not all jewels are, are round. But first, though, I want to I wanna bring this jewel back. Here we go. This is quite amusing, actually, for me. Because I have very unsteady hands. So there she is. I'm going to try to focus in on it a little bit more. That is a jewel. 
And that's it. And I'm going to now try to, I, I might edit the video a bit, but I'm going to try to really get in on it up close. So just give me a second. Okay, so there we are. We're now really zoomed in. And this is, it has to be a couple hundred times magnification. I'm, I'm not sure the specs of, of the microscope. Uh, by the way, this is a little USB plug-in microscope that I got off of uh, Amazon for about 20 bucks last year. And if you're inquisitive and you have kids and you like this kind of stuff, go out and buy one. They are really cool. Go outside, pick up some pieces of nature, bring them inside, hook it up to the computer, and you know, for a tenth of the price of a decent compound microscope, you have something like this. Anyway, so now looking at the Juul, the Ruby up close, and again, you can see it's a perfect cylinder, uh, you know, almost like a donut, and excuse me, and there's a hole in the center, and in that hole is where the gear would fit to spin. So what I like to do now is I'm going to show you now the whole movement of the watch and show you that not every jewel is like this. Some jewels are actually in a different configuration. So give me one second. So now I'm zoomed in on the balance. And so now you can see the balance wheel at the bottom. Now I'm going to point to the computer screen. The balance wheel. This would be the escape wheel. You can see the balance spring. That's these lines coming up. This is the circular spring that makes the balance go back and forth. And then what I want you to see here is this rectangular stone. This is a pallet stone. It also counts as, as a jewel or a ruby. And what it does is when the watch is, is sprung, you know, when it's fully wound up, uh, this escape wheel wants to spin. And what that does is it kicks this jewel out. The wheel spins a little bit and it gets caught on a, the other pallet stone on the other side and it stops. And then it all hinges on the balance. The balance moves the other way. Pallet stone gets kicked out again this wheel moves another notch and the process repeats and repeats you know in some cases 36,000 times an hour that mechanical process goes on and that's what keeps the beat of the watch but what I'd like to do next is I'm going to try to um, remove the balance and then we can try to look at the pallet stones um, just give me one second actually before I do that I want to show you something else and this is maybe all another watch and learn I'm, I'm probably giving you more than I intended to right now um, but now you're looking at the cap jewel, that jewel in the center, and this is your shock protection. You hear about KIF, you hear about Inca block, uh, shock protection, and this little clover-shaped spring is what the shock protection is. This is holding back this cap jewel. Underneath that cap jewel um, is usually another jewel, and the uh, it, it's conic-shaped, and the staff of the balance wheel fits in that conic section. And if it should hit any jolts or anything, this spring gives a little bit, lets the balance wheel oscillate, you know, vertically out of plane and w w without b damaging the balance, which is extremely delicate. Like I said, so let me get, I'm going to uh, try to take the balance uh, bridge off right now. Give me one second. Okay, so now I've taken the balance off and now we're looking at the escape wheel, which is this thing with the funny teeth I was telling you about before. And this is the fork and pallet stones. So here's a stone. And if you'd see it, it's under this bridge. Here's the stone. And what I'll do is I'm going to just, um, let me take out the, the wheel. I'll take out the escape wheel. Whoops. Again, guys, if you have steady hands, I commend you. I do not. That's why I don't work on watches. So now I've got it out. And so you can see this little fork here. I'm actually, you know what, I'm going to push it all up into maybe a little more of the center of the screen. So this fork oscillates back and forth between these two pins and you, see, you can see the stone right here, pallet stone, pallet stone. So these are considered jewels of a watch even though they're not your conventional jewels. Um, so this fork oscillates back and forth. The fork itself has a little pin on it here and that counteracts, you know, engages with a pin on the balance. So here I flip the balance over and you can see there's another jewel, a little ruby there, and that's what's going to push the uh, fork back and forth and, and cause the movement to go. So all this was really just to show you, you know, that there's different kinds of jewels. They're all just not the round ones um, for, for reducing friction in gears. Um, but they are the ones that when you flip over your watch, excuse me, they are the jewels that most people um, think about. You know, this one right here. And this is the one you can usually see. If you have a skeleton watch, you can see it in the front. You can see it in the back. Uh, you know, that's the one that people associate watches with. I'm going to do one more thing just to show you something. I'm going to 
take the bridge that I showed you in the beginning and if I could find the location, it was right here. So here, there's a there's a um, a jewel inside this bridge, and this is actually where, whoops, one of the auto winding gears went. And so you can see the back of the auto winder gear. Excuse me, I'm going to try to I'm going to adjust the focus so it's good for you guys. I hope you're not getting sick. Uh, it's got the little pin sticking out of the left hand side. It's going to fit in that little jewel. So I'm going to change the focus. drop it in, I'm going to use my fingers, and that's it, it just snapped right in. So now, this gear is actually free to rotate in a very, you know, low friction, predictable environment. And that's what, you know, that, that's what jewels do, that's how they reduce friction in the movement. Um, so again, when you're looking for a watch, don't go by jewel count, it's not an indication of quality. I mean, I guess if somebody tries to sell you a mechanical watch with four jewels, maybe you need to look the other way. But you know, you take take a company like Seiko or or Breitling or some of the other big boys who, in their quartz movements, will actually have upwards of four, five, six, seven jewels. All that means is those are really good quartz movements because most quartz movements have zero jewels. If you ever open the back of one of your uh, cheapy battery watches, it'll say zero jewels unadjusted. Uh, but if you're putting jewels in a quartz movement, you better believe you're you're aiming for quality. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, anyway, so this has been Mark from LongIslandWatch.com with episode number three of Watch and Learn. Uh, trying to teach you a little bit about jewels, rubies, uh, and what the count of them means. If you like this video, please like it. If you have not subscribed to our channel, please do so. If you have any questions or comments, put them down below. Uh, you guys are coming up with great ideas. Uh, the function of a mechanical watch movement would probably take 20 watch and learns, but maybe I could do one where I show you most of it. Uh, uh, but you guys have come up with great ideas. I appreciate it, and we will see you in the next one. Thank you very much.